Good evening, everyone. I am Ian Altavir, the Aaron I. Fleischmann Curator here in the Metz Department of Modern and Contemporary Art. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to our Grace Rainey Rogers Auditorium for this evening with Cecily Brown. I'm so thrilled to see such robust attendance for this great artist. Um, and I know you'll enjoy hearing her in conversation with my wonderful colleague, Adam Eaker. Um, a few quick thanks in advance of my brief introduction to the exhibition. Um, we're especially grateful to our modern circle. This is the department's um, special donor group um, who supports so many of our activities and makes exhibitions such as this very special show, Cecily Brown, Death and the Maid, possible. We're also endlessly grateful to the wonderful Agnes Gund, who has supported this exhibition and so many other things we do here at the Met and at so many other cultural institutions in this city and in the country. She is a true heroine. Um, and I'm thrilled to introduce briefly tonight um, the exhibition Cecily Brown, Death and the Maid. It opened to the public on April 4th, and the past few weeks have been a wonderful whirlwind of um, hosting many of you here at the museum to celebrate the show, to look at it. I know many of you have already seen it. Um, hopefully you will see it again since we have a really robust run until December 3rd. Um, the exhibition took shape um, largely over the past three tumultuous years. And I was so struck um, at, at seeing Cecily's amazing show at Paula Cooper Gallery in the autumn of October 2020, the extension of so many themes she had been already working on over the course of an extraordinary 25-year career, all of it spent here in New York City. Um, but I was particularly struck by a painting such as this one called Selfie. Um, which is dated to 2020, painted in those early months of the pandemic. And for me, it crystallized so many themes I had already known, the kind of um, crowded, claustrophobic interiors that the artist had made over, over the years, including a, a whole bunch of them 15 years before this picture. Um, but it also brought home to me a sensibility that I think many of us had shared, that during lockdown, alone often, or sometimes just with our families, um, quarantined in our apartments, surrounded by all of the objects we had accumulated over many years, in a sense of kind of claustrophobia, perhaps, um, that everything was sort of returning to us. Um, and life and its real precarity were put into high relief. It struck me that a painting like this could be an entree into an exhibition that I already knew was probably going to look at some themes of mortality and morality. Um, and in fact, my first professional encounter with the work of Cecily Brown had come many years before this. Um, in 2009, the Met received as a gift this wonderful small-scale triptych that was painted by the artist the year before, in 2008. It's called Fair of Face, Full of Woe. Um, a kind of uh, abbreviation of a rhyme that sort of a, a kind of fortune telling rhyme, Monday's child, right? Um, and it took me not so long to figure out that the left hand panel of this work um, is derived from a source that Cecily has used many, many times before and many times since then. Um, an illustration that was published in Life magazine in 1902 um, by Charles Allen Gilbert called All is Vanity. And here you see it paired with a painting, a much larger scale painting that uses the same theme, this double image or visual pun that presents us with the memento mori, right? The reminder of death's presence. And it struck me that these works would gain even more um, resonance, I think, um, after the moments that we had been living through. I was also struck by how this theme could connect with another grand tradition of memento mori painting, the vanitas still life. And here I'm showing you the Met's um, perhaps original vanitas painting um, by a, a, um, 
a Netherlandish artist called De Geen um, from 1603. And here alongside this skull, which is of course the ultimate reminder of death, other uh, things that point to life's fragility, the bubble that's so easy to burst, the flame that's been snuffed out, the flower that will soon fade. Um, it struck me too that Cecily herself had been working recently on still life painting an extension of that very same grand tradition. And I'm showing here a beautiful sketch after the Flemish artist, Van Snyders. Um, Cecily had been working on his hunting scenes for a project at Blenheim Palace in the English countryside and had shifted over to his wonderful, uh, vibrant still life paintings, often with these bright red tablecloths and equally bright red lobsters. Um, also with kitty cats sometimes lurking underneath the table. Um, and it struck me that that tradition of still life painting, that reminder, that moralistic reminder, right? That everything may soon come tumbling down. The glasses are already broken. The silver is beginning to tarnish. Um, the food begins to rot. Um, that they were also, in a way, such a touching reminder of the painful passage we had all had for some three years now. And that to begin the other side of the show or end it with this amazing um, and, and kaleidoscopic still life called Lobsters, Oysters, Cherries, and Pearls, also painted in 2020 and also with its first appearance at that Paula Cooper Gallery solo show in that autumn, um, would be another great bookend um, to a very special and kind of intimate look at this great artist's work. Um, I'm thrilled to welcome Cecily back to the Met. We had a great celebration for her at her opening, um, but it is always such a pleasure to hear her speak. Um, and it was even more of a delight to put her in conversation with my esteemed uh, colleague, Adam Eaker, at for the first time for our wonderful catalog, and I'm doing a shameless plug here, the, give, <laughs> the Met store remains open tonight until nine. They have many copies available. Um, but in the catalog, alongside my essay, is a wonderful conversation that Adam and Cecily's initial conversation about many works that are both of their favorites in, in these halls and on our walls. And so it is my hope, and I think we can expect a great um, uh, second part to that conversation tonight. Um, Cecily, of course, hopefully needs no introduction at this point, but my colleague Adam Eaker um, is an associate curator in the Department of European Paintings, where he's responsible for British and Northern European painting before 1800. Um, here at the Met, his projects have included in praise of painting, Dutch masterpieces at the Met, which is still on view in the um, lower level of our Lehman collection. Um, and the Tudors, Art and Majesty in Renaissance England, which many of you may have seen in recent months. He's the author of Van Dyke and the Making of English Portraiture, published in 2022. And he is always full of extraordinary insights on paintings of all sorts. Um, so I'm thrilled to welcome both Adam Eaker and Cecily Brown to the stage. I hope you enjoy their conversation. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. It's wonderful to have a full house for our conversation tonight. Cecily, we started talking to each other about painting and the Mets paintings in particular a little over a year ago, and I'm really looking forward to continuing this conversation. And when I was putting together the slides for tonight, I was uh, inspired by two things. One is this fantastic photo from the catalog, um, which gives a sense of some of the source material, the fodder for inspiration that you keep in your studio, which I've been lucky enough to visit a few times now. And I also read an interview with you from a few years ago where you described yourself as a magpie. And I think that really informs this wonderful collecting of a wide range of source material, everything from very canonical, 
old master paintings um, to visual jokes of the Edwardian era, illustrations to nursery rhymes. And I wanted to, to focus on that source material tonight and particularly ways in which you've been in dialogue with paintings here at the Met from, from all different eras. Um, and I thought we would begin by talking a little bit about your, your practice of drawing. One of the many things that I love in the show is the inclusion of a number of your sketchbooks. And I'm someone who, even though I'm a paintings curator, I always love looking at drawings and thinking about how they show the artist's mind at work. And I think that's something uh, we really get an insight into in the exhibition. And so I couldn't resist starting with this moment of you looking at one of the most delightful pictures, I think, in the Mets collection, um, Flagonar's Woman with a Dog. And in the show, we have this sketchbook page where you've made a study, both of it and of um, Manet's Nana. And I wanted to, to talk with you a little bit about what drew you, first of all, to this um, painting and, and, and the process of copying and how it informs your practice. Um, hi, everyone. Um, and thanks, thank you for coming. I am a little bit nervous, so um, bear with me. I also wanted Adam to keep this spontaneous, so we have not practiced. What we're going to, uh, I, d I don't know the slides he's going to show, so I thought that would, it would be more fun if we kept it spontaneous. Um, I mean, I think this is actually a perfect place to start because the fact that there are two images on one page kind of sum up my attitude towards other people's images. Um, it's kind of what happens to be on the table is what I'll draw that day. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's pretty casual, as you'll see from the slide before. There's so much sort of effluvia yeah. of like, when I see pictures I like and I'll just print them out, like rubbishy um, printouts from the computer. So um, often it's just, it can be anything from a news photo these days to, you know, Artle, if I do Artle and I'm like, oh, it's a really nice painting I didn't know. And then once a week or so, I'll go through and print out a ton of things off my phone now. But um, over the years, you know, I've more or less copied everything. Um, I think it probably started with Hogarth, probably around early 2000. No, that's not true. I think, well, I drew from life all the time as a kid. And, mm -hmm. you know, I still think students should all draw from life. Um, but once I'd left art school, I often drew from photographs um, and my early paintings. I, but I always preferred to have a source. I like to have something to copy when I draw. And I think that probably comes from years of life drawing, but something outside of myself, an object. So I sometimes don't really like my line when it's made up. Like it's too fuzz, fudgy and mm. woolly and not strong enough. But if I copy, my line's just much more direct. <clears throat> and it's, I don't think it started like this, but it's very much become, you know, the way I get information. And I feel, um, you know, I don't really know a work of art till I've copied it. And it's very much a way of committing it to memory, but very much to your painting brain so that you can use it later on. And that's where the kind of magpie attitude comes in. Because if you think about walking around a museum's collection and the number of things you'll see in a day, you know, I feel like painters, you are sort of storing up little moments for later and um, they come out when you paint, but, but drawing isn't like, a, it's a warming up of, I think, your eye and hand, and it feels, it's very, always very essential to me, um, because in the end, it's just about looking very closely at something. I love how you describe it as a process of internalization, and then it becomes a resource that you can carry with you. Obviously, copying has been a traditional part of artists' educations for centuries, and we have a very robust program of copying in the galleries here at the Met. I was curious, when you were growing up, when you were training at the Slade, were you actually going to the National Gallery in London and copying, or is it something that um, you practice more, I guess, privately through the mediation of reproductions. It, I always feel like the artists who copy here are very much on display mm. and they have to really develop like a mental defense against everyone who's peering over their yeah. shoulder. Yeah, and I peer over their shoulders when I see them. Me I too. always look at artists. Yeah. And funnily enough, it reminded me when I was in your exhibition when we were installing my show mm -hmm. and taking a break and um, seeing these young artists copying, these, doing painting. I could never paint like that. Like, I don't know how to do what they were doing. So I do look at them in a fascinated way. But I was remembering how on the village green when I was little in like suburban England, painters, you know, amateur painters would come and paint the local church and things. 
we'd always, I'd always be really fascinated with, you know, looking over their shoulder. But sorry, that's a complete aside. It just suddenly made me think of that. Um, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> Whether copying was something you were told to do as right. a student or you just came no, to so your own. I remember um, going to the National Gallery a lot, but I only really remember copying one thing, an El Greco, um, which I loved copying, uh, Christ in the Temple, um, you know. Yeah, amazing. And, uh, but I remember looking at Auerbach and the, the copies that he'd made of Titian and really loving them. And I think in a way those were probably super influential that I can't remember where I saw them, it was just in an exhibition in London, I think, but copies, um, Auerbach done these very fierce copies after Titian mm. and a lot of things in the National Gallery. Um, and I think also Picasso, seeing, because uh, there was a great late Picasso show when I was very young, I think 21 or so, that was super influential on me um, at the Pompidou in Paris. And uh, the erotic drawings and certainly the subject of late Picasso really influenced me in terms of my early subject and being drawn to, you know, erotic imagery, um, etc. But um, it was also Picasso's attitude towards Manet and Raphael and Velasquez. And I really feel like people like Picasso and Bacon, because I always loved Bacon, talking about Velasquez. So I really came to older art through the art I was immediately drawn to as a teenager, like Picasso or Bacon. Yeah, I think one way to make the history of art approachable is to think of it as a conversation that's happening across time. And, and it's one of the things that I so much love in your work is you have a lot of very interesting conversation partners. Um, I almost want to ask you that icebreaker question of if you were going to have a dinner party with any, oh, no. <laughs> any artist from the past or have a conversation about painting with, with anyone, um, who would you invite? I think Manet, probably Goya. Um, I don't know. I don't really want to get into it. That would be a good, a good yeah, pair. Yeah, that would be a good start. Yeah. Delacroix could be fun. A little bit before you um, began working, I think, with, with Ian on this project for the Met, you had another project that was very much about the dialogue with historic art and with a very historic building. You were commissioned to do a series of paintings for Blenheim Palace, which is one of the most celebrated of English country houses, iconic place. And you did um, this wonderful series of, of installations, um, largely responding to the work of, of Franz Snyder's, the 17th century French animal, uh, Flemish, excuse me, animal and, and still life painter. I, could you tell us a little bit about how did that project come about and, and what was it like to be working in these, these very heavy Baroque interiors with all of these um, faces and paintings uh, peering over your, uh, your shoulder, and so to speak. Um, well, I think uh, the Blenheim Foundation, who are like the contemporary part of Blenheim uh, Palace, they'd been doing a series of shows of people like Maurizio Catalan and um, Lawrence Wiener and various other people, I think Jenny Holzer. Mm -hmm. And um, I think what happened was, I can't really remember exactly how it started, but they'd seen, I had a show at the Louisiana and Michael Fram, actually, I do remember, saw it and immediately said, oh my gosh, I think this show would look great at Blenheim. This is probably incredibly indiscreet of me to say. <laughs> um, but um, I thought, no, if I'm gonna do a show at Blenheim, I would you know, really rather make something very specific for Blenheim, which was really unusual for me because until then, I'd very, very rarely done anything that was, could have be described as a commission in any way. Mm -hmm. And always just preferred to paint without not even knowing what exhibition or where I'd be showing things. But with the Blenheim, I just jumped at the chance because, um, you know, being it's, from England, yeah. it was the middle of Brexit, you know, everything breaking down and such an interesting time. And it was what, 2006, 17 or so. So it's pretty intense time politically. Um, and it just seemed, um, ideal and I think as I told you um, in our interview in the catalogue that you know I didn't plan paintings for specific moments so some of them we showed on these easels like this um, this painting was actually the first time I in years like since art school I drew out the painting in charcoal first because um, I always I'm trying to be more figurative and things just get abstract really quickly so with this I was like because I was making lots of drawing copies of the Snyder's hunt um, and I was, you know, learning so much from doing them. 
And then when I'd go to paint them, they were becoming super messy straight away. So I thought, well, why don't I just draw it out in charcoal? And um, it was, in a way, it's more like a drawing colored in than a painting. It's very thin, um, but I love it. Um, it feels sort of, this feels very site specific to me. Um, and, you know, I'm a huge anti-hunting person and I can't bear the, all the, you know, cruelty that still goes on. So I loved putting the hunt in the middle of these places. Um, and there were interventions in lots of rooms in lots of different ways. And in fact, the curator from Louisiana did work on the show with me as a kind of consultant. We had good ideas about funny little places to put works. Like we had some drawings of hunts, but also erotic drawings in with some china in like a porcelain cabinet. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it was, it was wonderful. But this, not to bore on about the pandemic, but I never got to see the show. It's such a shame. Yeah. Um, but luckily, I'd been to Blenheim twice, I think, for two days each time. So I'd managed to spend a lot of time walking around the rooms. But yeah, so anyway, moving on. Yeah. The title of the show, Death and the Maid, is of course a play on this longstanding motif of, of Death and the Maiden, famous from Schubert, but even before that, the subject of, of Prince going back to the Northern Renaissance. And another of the sketchbooks included in the show is um, your study after Edvard Bunch's depiction. And I wonder, I think there's an argument to be made about this tradition um, that associates beautiful young women with, with death and, and eroticizes the, the embrace of uh, death and a, and, a, and a maiden, a young, beautiful woman, that um, there is a hostility in it to to women and to female beauty and a lot of anxiety about female sexuality. And I wanted to ask whether your appropriation of this imagery contains an element of subversion, of critique, um, if you could respond to that at all. I mean, I don't want to try and get out of it too easily, but I do think in a way that kind of reading is in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that is a case where I think I make the images and the viewer can decide. Um, maybe that is too fence sitting. I don't know. I actually haven't really thought of it like that. Um, I always found monks women so moving. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've talked. We've talked a bit about you know, obviously the woman as object in a painting is different from a woman's point of view. So, you know, in a way, I've often avoided painting a single female nude. It's actually one of the rarest you know, subjects that I ever use. Um, people might be surprised to hear that, but usually when there are nudes, there are plenty and they're of, of all sexes. And um, um, then when I did paint naked women, I painted like 13 of them at once in those electric lady lamb paintings. Mm -hmm. But you know, in, in, in all, there's been actually very little. Um, so, but I feel like I was always very sympathetic towards monks, women, even though they're so idealized. I mean, um, they kind of remind me of my mother. <laughs> um, I don't know, what do you think? Yeah, well, I I was really moved by the Monk show that was at Met Breuer a few years back. Um, and I felt like learning more of, of his life story, how the biography informed the painting, gave me new insight, of course. Um, and yeah, I think there is, of course, this vampiric quality to some of the women, but they're also very powerful. Um, and that is, is very I think I too. identify more with them than with the guy in the scream. Right. You know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's complicated being the woman in the mirror. And uh, I mean, I wonder what you're going to show next if you're... I'm trying to remember. This is an image that uh, Ian already showed, but it's our, our wonderful early, um, perhaps the earliest Vanitas painting by, by Jacques de Chain. And in a way, when this tradition starts, it's, it's very on the nose. As Ian already said, that, you know, all the symbols of, of transience are there, the skull, but also the extinguished lamp, the soap bubble. Um, and I just, wanted to bring this pairing together to, to start maybe walking through some of the iconographic motifs that the exhibition is, is structured around. Um, and I 
love that you're you're drawn to skulls, but you're also drawn to the playful imagery of skulls. It's not just a macabre set of images, but they're, they're visual jokes, they're puns. Yeah. And language, of course, is so important to you, the titles that you come up with. And so, I mean, talk again, a I bit. barely think of them as macabre at all. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, the thing that bothers me now is that people are going to ask my opinion about death just because <laughs> of the show. And it's just like, I just cut that question. Them, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's not that I can want to talk about it particularly, but um, I mean, were you always, now I feel yeah. like the skull was stolen by Connecticut. <laughs> I have this real bee in my bonnet about how things became so mainstream that I think I avoided painting skulls for a long time. I think in 2005 was just, I just really love this image. I'm going to, you know, put it out there. But um, so in a way, I just, I think of this so much as the two little girls and the dog mm -hmm. that I kind of, I do almost forget that it's a skull. And I think that is part of the, the pleasure of looking at your, your, your paintings is that um, there's a durational quality to, to any great painting that we discover its layers the longer we look. But I, I feel like you really thematize that in adopting these motifs from visual jokes, from trick images. Um, you can't see both at the same time, so you have to spend time toggling. Yes. I mean, in a way, it sums up what I'm always trying to do with my painting. It's almost like um, if I had to illustrate what I'm trying to do with abstraction and figuration, in a way, of uh, just that, and the, just the toggling back, as you say, between one reading of something and another. Um, so this is almost like an archetype for me, um, a, a real sort of motif painting. Um, but, you know, I think Hogarth, again, to go back to the copying. Mm -hmm. um, I think he was the first artist I copied from a lot. And one of the things I've always loved about him is he's so funny. Like a lot yeah. of your Flemish and Dutch guys, like Hals, I was looking at recently. And, you know, I just love that sort of humor. And um, Hogarth's completely hilarious. Um, and there are so many jokes in the work. Um, and, you know, I think some of these, this was supposed to have kind of a light touch. You know, it said, it's sort of tongue in cheek. Um, but it's also a very appealing image to me. Um, but, you know, I was obsessed with Jasper Johns and Duck Rabbit mm -hmm. and my wife and my mother-in-law and that whole double, double image. So in a way, I got into them through the work of Jasper Johns because I saw that huge exhibition at MoMA. I think that was mid-90s. Um, and I got kind of obsessed with the Duck Rabbit and that sort of led me to these. And I think when I first stumbled across this, which is a really famous image, um, the Orchardby Rose, as is the Vanity, um, it's funny because I think at the time I was kind of reluctant to make them because I thought it was all too obvious, you know, to do something so graphic. But at the same time, it really satisfied my need to do something more figurative. And again, to copy something that already exists, it's almost like takes away the um, guilt. Yeah. <laughs> it's not mine. It's just, I'm just, you know. Found object. Yeah, it, exactly. Yeah. You've talked in a number of interviews about feeling when you were a student in London that painting had fallen out of fashion, that it was almost embarrassing to be a painter at that moment, and that New York, in a, in a sense, was liberating. You could really grow as a painter here. I wonder if, if this element of, of levity, wit, playfulness that is, is so characteristic of your work, is that also a way to, to redeem painting, to not take it so seriously? Yeah, 100%. I mean, my title is at first, and you'll notice if you've seen the show that the early paintings are really shiny, especially the really huge one, Father of the Bride, because I used to varnish things like crazy mm -hmm. because I was so ashamed of the amount of paint and the gesture and all those things. You know, it was, I think, a really deep art shame um, that it's probably hard for young artists to really understand how it felt. Like, it was embarrassing. It wasn't almost embarrassing. Um, and the worst thing was kind of agreeing with the people who thought painting was a terrible thing to be doing on some level, um, or like understanding why it was wrong. Um, but yeah, I do think, you know, so varnishing them, I felt like gave them some distance and made them less like abex mm -hmm. and everything. All the art I liked at the time was really shiny. Um, but I thought the shininess also made them a little more 
you know, look less, less like just fourth generation ABEX um, and show that they were, you know, something flashy, <laughs> maybe. No, flashy is the wrong word, though it was, you know, that, that painting does look flashy compared to the others because of the varnish. Um, and every time I see it, I want to varnish everything again. But <laughs> <laughs> it's so bad for, it's so, uh, anyway, I, I'm, I can't. I'm fascinated by titles because in the period that, that I study, the 17th century, paintings didn't usually have titles. It's very rare that they were given titles by their artists. But titling is such a key part of your practice and, and this wit and this levity that we've discussed. And I wonder if you could tell me a, bit, a little bit about the moment when you, when you christen a painting, so to speak. Um, is it when it leaves the studio? Is it while you're working on it? Do you have titles in your head before the painting exists? Um, I keep an ongoing list of titles all the time. So, but you know, they're almost always ready-made things. So song lyrics or titles or more recently, I used to be much stricter and use only fun things like musicals and pop songs, but I have used the Bible and some po more poetry in the last few years just because you've run out of, you know, run out of things. So I think I've taken titles from nearly everything, like perfumes. Um, um, I loathe untitled from when I, you know, from the super pretentious like art that was around when I was young. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the titles were definitely for me a way of showing levity, as was signing my name on the front, like just my first name. Um, although that was Alex Katz's idea, just to name drop when I... <laughs> He, uh, he suggested, why don't you sign them just your first name? Because we were talking about signing things on the front. And I thought it was hilarious because it really showed that it wasn't this macho gestural thing, that it had a sense of humor. And it, because it almost looked like Cecily, aged 13 and a half, you know, it's just this childish hand, just, and the, that, and the titles. Um, just, yeah, because painting, it felt like if you were a painter, you must have this high seriousness about it. Um, and also that if you were a painter, you were sort of rejecting everything else, which wasn't the case, because I was responding to all art in every medium, and obviously film and, you know, everything. This is just an example of, of one of your, your sources. Um, and then, again, this image that, that Ian already showed that's been so crucial for you, uh, the Charles Allen Gilbert, All is Vanity, lithograph. And I love, again, it is a form of wordplay. We have vanitas still lifes with skulls and bubbles, but then also the image of the woman at her dressing table, her vanity. I remember as, as a little boy sitting fascinated while my mother would um, put on her makeup at her vanity table. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the origin of your, your fascination for this subject matter. Did it start with the found image of, of the Gilbert or did the vanity table already occupy a place in your imagination? I mean, one reason I really loved Ian's idea for this show when he told me was because I felt like it was this little known corner of my work and that he did pluck out these moments from really early to now where the vanity had recurred over and over. I hadn't really noticed quite how much I'd gone back to it because I go back to so many subjects. I mean, I repeat myself a lot. So, um, but, um, and this was funny. This was one of those paintings that was never in an exhibition. So at the time, so uh, I felt like nobody really knew about it. But um, in a way, the key painting is the, uh, the only game in town. Um, which is the earliest thing in the show, um, or the earliest painting, the yellow one, um, which is a woman looking in a mirror. Ah, uh, there we go. Because that's all about looking, and I really wanted it to be about the pleasure of looking, mm. but also being looked at. So it was, um, you know, but I've, I've, I heard some ladies talking about it in the exhibition, and, um, I feel like people are reading it too much as like a young woman looking at an old woman, which I didn't mean as much. When I talk about like the, the, the form to the left is supposed to be based on my wife and my mother-in-law, the optical illusion that John's used a lot. But the actual figure looking in the mirror, she, I think I must have already known the Gibson judging by her zipper and, and the chair. Um, but it's really, I think it is 
fairly close to a self-portrait. And it's not supposed to be looking into the horror. It was actually like examining under my tongue. <laughs> <laughs> But um, no, it's, compl it's always more complicated than that. And the label is absolutely right. It is about those things. But also, it's, I mean, the mirror has always been um, fascinating to me in terms of art, but also just something that's recurred so much in my work. And, you know, again, I mean, I think it's some, for someone else to write about, but like the copy as mirror in a way. Mm -hmm. And Ian writes in the catalogue essay about the way I mirror drawings. So one thing I've been doing more recently is not just copying old masters, but reversing them when I copy them, which is so difficult, but really fun. Um, and Ian, I think, saw those around the time he started thinking about the mirroring too. But um, yeah, I'm just so pleased that Ian paid so much attention to the mirror in my work, because as I said, I feel like it was had sort of slipped by unnoticed. Um, people fo have often focused on other things in my work. It was only when I was preparing for this conversation that I realized that probably my favorite 17th century Dutch painting here at the Met is, is an image of a woman at, at a mirror, at a kind of vanity table. I've put it on, on the right, this terbor of a young woman um, adjusting the laces of her bodice while her, her maid servant waits with a, um, a pitcher of water. And one thing I've been struck by, because I find this to be such a, a tender and, and loving act of scrutiny that, that Terborg has, has done here, but the, the literature on this painting really wants to moralize it. Oh, this is an image of vanity. She's, uh, you know, narcissistic. She's focused on herself in the mirror when she should be praying or making lace or something. Um, and that, to me, you kind of have to not look at the painting to make that argument. I've always felt I, I don't see this as a moralizing image. Um, and again, I, I wonder if, and maybe this is, as you say, a question for, for the art historians to write about, but there's almost a redemption of the mirror in your work. And, and as you said, the pleasure of scrutiny and self-scrutiny in mirrors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what it feels like for men because you know, you're just so conscious of the male gaze as a woman growing up. Um, and so when you see, when I was younger, I didn't have a problem. I didn't really notice how it was only male white artists we were looking at because uh, I just loved painting so much. And that was just the way it was, I thought, you know, and hadn't realized how neglected so many people had been. But, you know, I just bought the whole story. So um, I feel like in a way, though, that a woman has an advantage when looking at painting because when you're also the subject of the painting, you, it's like when you're watching a movie and you, if the actor's good, you think that you're them, right? Mm. So when you're looking at a painting, in a way, you know, it's, it can be much richer and deeper if you also identify with the person. Um, but you also identify with being looked at. But then, yeah, I guess with my mirror, I mean, I'm looking back. Um, it's that idea of, of a double consciousness, right? That you're aware of yourself, but you're aware of yourself as yeah. being looked at. And I've always loved that cheesy thing that's in both Mary Poppins and I think Black Swan, <laughs> where uh, you know your reflection in the mirror starts doing something different mm. from what you're actually doing. Like I love little creepy things like that. Yeah. Did children in England play that game with the mirror, uh, Bloody Mary? Oh, this is going to be a tangent. Sorry, everybody. But this was always my, my favorite and scariest thing to do at sleepover parties is you wait until the stroke of midnight and you throw water on the, on the mirror and then you say Bloody Mary, oh. I, I don't know, 30 times and she appears in the mirror. Did she ever? Well, when you're eight, <laughs> you think she does. No, there was a version of that, though, that I found terrifying. And as soon as I heard for it, of it, I knew I would never do it. But it still frightened me to talk about it where you're supposed to I think it was like brush your hair at midnight while looking in a mirror with a candle or maybe an orange or something. <laughs> but you, and then you'd see the devil if you did it. And I was like, there's no way I'm doing that. <laughs> but there is something about, obviously with the mirror, you know, it's the other world, but it's also the picture, the painting, but it is the mystery of the mirror, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and the puddle and, you know, or water, the reflection and shadow. 
Yeah, there's that great line from from Alberti's treatise on painting in the 15th century. He says something like, what is painting but the attempt to grasp the reflection on the water? You know, this idea of you, you see something and then the moment you move, it's it's lost. Right. Yeah, that's exactly what painting is. Yeah. Right. Let's see what we have up next. Um, I think we already talked a little bit about Franz Snyder's, but I wanted to um, shift into thinking about your still life imagery and particularly your response to the great Dutch and Flemish still lives of the 17th century. I, I couldn't resist this pairing because we have naughty cats in yeah. both. Um, am, am I correct in reading those eyes under the table as a cat? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, I, I heard that someone said the cat or the devil. Um, oh. Yeah. Well, as I said, it's in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. For, for a... I was curious at what stage of, of painting this, this magnificent still life those eyes appeared. Oh, I think he, he was there pretty much from the beginning. Yeah. Because some of I was copying a lot of Snyder's drawings. So after I got into the hunts, um, my good friend Joe Messer gave me a beautiful, great big book of Snyder's in German, so I haven't read any of it, mm. but with absolutely wonderful pictures, and I started getting really into the still lives, and I was astonished that I'd never looked at them closely before. But I only knew of him a little bit. But Anyway... Um, but yes, so one of my favorite things about Snyder's is the cat under the table. And that cat has appeared as well over many years. You could do a show of the cat in my work if you looked really closely. <laughs> um, so, but again, with Hogarth, and I, I love this painting of the dissolute maid, or whatever her name is, the dissolute household. Yeah. Um, this is one of, of the treasures of the Linsky collection here at the Met. Um, not a still life proper, although it contains many still life elements, but we see uh, it's actually a self-portrait. So the artist is at the center, clearly had a bit too much to drink, as has his wife. The maid is refilling her glass while he's twining fingers with her. The wife has her, her foot on a book that looks a bit like the Bible, um, so she's really misbehaving. The kids are running wild. And then there's just the most refined and delicious still life in the midst of it all, this blue and white porcelain bowl and all this fruit. And that's what I love with, with Jan Steen, this artist, is he's, he's so refined in his technique and so ribald mm -hmm. in his subject matter. And he's always, the joke is always on him. Yeah. I mean, you wonder what his wife thought when she saw the painting. Yeah, there's, there's actually, um, uh, his first biographer says that she was always berating him for oh. saying, you make us look like drunks. Oh, and, no. you know, <laughs> the, yeah. Oh, if he was really clever, the wife could have played the maid in the painting. Oh, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I love the uh, I love the subject. I love paintings like this. But I don't think mine have a moralizing edge particularly, um, you know, just to go back to that. Yeah, and it's, it's one of these big debates within art history. So many dissertations have been written about it. Is an image like, are we supposed to look at this Jan Steen and say, oh, I really, I have to cut back on my drinking, I have to behave, I have to be a good good husband, good right. uh, mother, or are you just supposed to laugh? Right. And I have always fallen on the yes. laugh I side. Agree. And I think I'm just realizing that Dutch are probably the funniest painters of all. I can't think of, like, you know, however much I love French painting. They're not very funny, are they? <laughs> I'm afraid not. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it is something so so striking that they gave themselves the permission to have fun in their painting, even though yeah. it, if you read about the culture at the time, this was a very strict Calvinist yeah. state. Mm -hmm. um, but it's almost like painting became an escape valve. Mm -hmm. And that's why I don't really buy the argument that you, you spent a lot of money on this very beautiful painting to feel bad about your misbehavior. Mm -hmm. I, know. I mean, who do you want to be in the painting? Maybe the cat. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's what I was going to say about Hogarth and the cat, because often with Hogarth, the cat or the dog will be catching the eye of the viewer. And you always feel like it's this little wink, yeah. which I love. And back to, we don't have to go back to it, but the idea of the painting that's about looking. When I was the only game in town, that was very much, I wanted something that was about the pleasure of looking, but also, and I think later that just really has become the subject of that's the the, the reason for this whole, now you see it, now you don't, to put it in a crass way, is to try and kind of, I mean, well, I've said that a million times, of the thing of the slow read, but um, maybe that's the moralizing side. It's like, <laughs> you've got to slow down to look at them. Um, 
I, I was struck with this, the still life on the left that um, it's one of the few paintings in, in your body of work that, that feels like it looks back at you, I would say. Um, that often there's, a, there's almost a sense of a, of a presence there that's scrutinizing our reaction or, you know, are we tempted or something? Or am I totally off base there? Um, would it be the cat? Yeah, looking? the cat looks back. Mm. I mean, I think in No You For Me, you know, the fact that there's a mirror and she's looking back at you. Right, you're right. Um, yeah. But yeah, you're right. I mean, I avoided doing faces and eyes for so long because I always find that the face, you know, pins things down, pins the meaning down too much. So I've really grappled with that. So I guess this sort of writes that large by putting the gaze under the table. <laughs> but um, I think at the moment there are a lot of, things gazing back at you in my work so but no you're probably right um there's a wonderful book by the poet mark doty which is about a, a single still life um in the mets collection and he it launches him on this whole meditation about memory and collecting and things and he has this line in there that he says still life is a genre that points to the human by leaving the human out and I have always kept that in my head, that these meals are, they didn't manifest themselves. They were put there by a person. And so often when I look at still lives, I think about who's just gotten up from the table. Um, I wonder if that resonates I, with I you I like that all. idea. Um, I mean, like a lot of people, I used to find, some people still do find still life really boring. You know, like growing up, it would be my, one of the last things I'd be drawn to. Um, but now I'm obsessed with it and can't understand how I never, why I wasn't always. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think in a way, I love um, the debris of a meal or a restaurant or a bar or, you know, and what it shows, like the fallen tablecloth and mm -hmm. the um, remains of things. Um, yeah, I've, I'm sort of flabbergasted to see my painting beside that one. <laughs> so, um. Do you ever stage your own still lives to, to work from or is it always mediated? I can't work from life. I can't paint from yeah. life. I would kill myself if I... It's too hard. It's just too hard. And I'd never do it to a standard where I'd be happy with it. So I would, will draw from life. Um, but no. What I've done in the past a, a few times is, um, like I once sorted out a couple of paintings that I was really struggling with because I think it had been my birthday, so I'd had a lot of flowers and I just had them in front of the painting. And I was still in there and the light was going down and um, the shadows of the flowers suddenly really made the painting look fantastic. Mm. And I realized, oh, so I basically just painted them right in, like as they were from life. And they really work like as a device to have these quite realistic, semi-realistic flowers in the front. But um, no, it's that thing of like, I don't want to see my version of that. Because mm -hmm. I mean, I do think, I mean, if I paint a still life from life, I'd want it to look like that. And it just never would. So, you know, I wasn't taught to paint in an academic way. And I know a lot of people who were feel imprisoned by it and think I'm quite lucky that I wasn't taught in a super tight way because, but sometimes, you know, you know, I could not do that to save my life, basically. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> yeah. Um, finally, I just wanted to um, ask you a little bit about your your relationship to the Met. Um, you're a, a transplant to New York, um, as are many of us, and um, sort of how it's functioned for you over over the years that you've you've spent in this city. I think I said to you on the phone that actually, when I first lived here, I didn't come here a lot because I think I was so in love with the idea of New York and America being new that, you know, I grew up in Europe and I've been to many European cities and spent so much time in museums in London. And I almost feel like going to the National Gallery a lot as a student, it was almost like I had my paintings, you know, that I had my favorites and I'd been to the, it's so lucky if you grew up in Europe, you know, I'd been to the Prado and you know, Louvre and everything, and you fit to you before I moved here. So I don't think I felt like I needed European painting particularly. 
And I was more interested in like going to the supermarket and seeing, you know, <laughs> than coming to the Met. So it took me a while. <laughs> to That's be brutally okay. honest. But yeah. I mean, I came here, but I didn't spend a lot of time here till later. And then, of course, I'd come. And I was thinking after our conversation, I usually when I'd come, I'd come and see some great show. So I had saw most of the huge, wonderful painting shows over many years, but did not get to know the collection that well till I'd say the last 10, 15 years. Well, I've only been, I've been here 25 years or so, 28 years. So yeah, and a lot of it was after my daughter and um, where I've gotten to know much more of the collection, like Arms and Armour, spent many happy hours in mm -hmm. Arms and Armour. It's the gateway um, drug. Which, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I figured you can bring kids to museums if you don't, force them to look at contemporary art. <laughs> but if they want to, but you know, I, I think the trick is to let them decide what to look at to make them love museums. So, um, but now I know the collection pretty well and you know, I absolutely love the Met. And also since she was little, we come every year to see the Christmas tree, which is one of my, I mean, that aesthetic of those Italian, if, an, if people haven't seen it, it's just you have to see this most beautiful. It's like a Tintoretto come to life, right? Or Tiepolo yeah. come to life. It's absolutely gorgeous. Anyway, so that was a big thing. And then, you know, obviously, over the years, I've come many, many times. And But um, I was thinking about the exhibitions that have meant the most. And there were a lot at the Breuer, actually. Mm. Like The Monk was yeah. incredible. Amazing show. The Asselmans and just things of the last few years and Kerry James Marshall. Um, but also the Delacroix show here was a huge favorite of mine. Um, that wasn't that long ago. No. Um, and there was Franz Hals, but there wasn't that much Hals in it, I remember. Yeah, that was before my time, uh, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think it's time for another Franz Hals show. All right. Um, well, I think that is a, a nice note to end on and, and a wonderful invitation. Uh, the museum is open for a couple more hours, so please go um, make your own way through the galleries and, and make sure to visit Cecily's wonderful show if you haven't. Thank you so much, Cecily.